Hello, my name is Gareth Westwood, Head of Global Intelligence here at Civiline, and this is the Deep Dive recording on Friday 17th of February. Since the earthquakes of February the 6th that rocked southern Turkey, a catastrophic humanitarian disaster is unfolding in southern Turkey, northern Syria and the wider region. Today we are joined by Valeria Scuto and Rhiannon Phillips to discuss the wider impacts going forward. Rhiannon, welcome back to the podcast and welcome Valeria. First of all, I know many of our listeners and our viewers will be keeping told of exactly what's happening day by day. However, what is happening on the ground as we are recording? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're over 10 days post earthquakes now and rescue missions and kind of search missions are continuing. Um, we're seeing, you know, incredible stories of people being pulled from the rubble still, still alive, um, you know, well in kind of 10 days, 10 days later. So those rescue missions haven't stopped. And that's quite critical just in terms of kind of state resources and where these are being allocated. We are likely to see a shift in rescue search missions in the next couple of days, kind of more focusing on the construction of informal settlements and kind of prioritizing food and shelter over potential um, kind of rescue and search missions as this window of opportunity to find kind of live individuals uh, narrows and shortens. And what has the initial public reaction been? You said it's been 10 days now. What have you been seeing from your desk? Yeah, absolutely. So the death toll keeps on con continuing to rise. Uh, so it's at about 43,000 at, at, at the current um, time between southern Turkey and northern Syria. Um, this is expected to top 50,000 as well. We've seen that from multiple different agencies and, and kind of aid support uh, institutions. Um, so as the death toll rises and as we see kind of um, increased infrastructural damage, etc., obviously there is going to be heightened public backlash and dissent. Um, in the days after the earthquakes initially, obviously, a focus and attention was more on rescue missions. And now we're starting to see kind of more um, public rhetoric towards, you know, who's to blame, why there is such a high death toll. Um, and most of this has been targeted towards uh, President Erdogan's government. Um, we've seen real kind of um, an uptick in kind of the political opposition rhetoric as well, um, bringing up things from kind of uh, years previously. Um, so one of the main things and one of the main questions people are asking, you know, is why so many buildings um, basically collapsed when there was supposed to be this massive overhaul of construction laws um, from 2013, really. Um, so we saw buildings that were, you know, constructed in 2012, 2013, practically pancaking, um, whereas they had been told, you know, local authorities had affirmed that these were earthquake proof buildings so obviously you know in in the immediate aftermath people weren't too focused on that but now we're seeing 10 days later that this rhetoric towards you know why have these buildings collapsed so quickly who's to blame etc really really start to accelerate and take momentum um, crucially we're seeing you know, massive amounts of social media traction as well, um, surrounding kind of videos of Erdogan from 2019 that have resurfaced, where he's basically said um, he, he's granted kind of amnesty policies, and it's called zoning peace in Turkey, um, to, to well over kind of 205,000 individuals in the most um, impacted areas of the earthquake. So the Hatay, Osmania, um, Kahara, Manmaris as well. Um, he visited these areas in 2019 and basically said, I'm going to help you build with granting you this zoning piece. And what this meant is these individuals were basically able to bypass um, construction codes. And what that's now meant, obviously, is, you know, the opposition has really pinpointed this and said this is the reason why so many buildings have collapsed so quickly. And ultimately, Erdogan is the reason why the death toll is so high, etc. So this is a very, very um, strong political rhetoric going into the elections, which are scheduled um, for May currently. Um, potentially June, uh, but, but we don't know. That's another kind of question. But there's very, very strong public backlash towards uh, the government at the moment, the Turkish government. Really interesting thoughts there on the, on the politics, which we will come to. But I want to bring uh, Valeria in just very briefly. Uh, the number of homeless and displaced people is continuing to grow, as are the casualty figures, with the exact figures still unknown, yet to be determined. What are the trends that we're likely to see in the next you know, three to six months? Uh, yes, as you mentioned, uh, numbers keep rising and uh, the uh, number of homeless people could reach 5 million uh, in Syria, so quite daunting figures. Um, what, of course, uh, we are expected to see in the coming months is the creation on informal um, IDP camps, 
uh, but also there will likely be an increase in um, refugee and migratory flows. And that's something that has already been highlighted within Turkey domestically. Um, there's uh, strong anti-Syrian sentiments. Um, but as well, this is something that uh, European countries will uh, look at, uh, particularly as um, spring approaches and overland and maritime transport routes become more favorable. This will be um, something uh, quite relevant, both in terms of security implications and both in terms of diplomatic relations. Uh, Northern Syria is a smuggling hub, and uh, we're likely to see uh, organized crime groups as well as terror groups uh, like HTS, uh, as well as rebel groups like the Syrian National Army take advantage of what is a very lucrative activity in those areas. Thank you, Val. So uh, a host of implications there, security, economic, political, um, potentially criminal. So uh, I'm just going to go back to Rhiannon briefly. You, you touched on uh, the elections uh, during your first, uh, your first answer. What impact do you think um, this incident, these incidents will have on the upcoming elections? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's first worth noting that these were already going to be highly contested elections, I think possibly Turkey's most contested, um, it, you know, amid a backdrop of really, really quite um, deteriorating socioeconomic conditions. We've seen Turkey's inflation rate uh, reach record highs, not just in Turkey, but also globally, you know, we've seen it top 85% um, at the end of last year. And, uh, you know, in Turkey, this is daunting, but even kind of externally, uh, an inflation rate of 85% is, is not kind of a, a good situation to be in. Um, so there's been a lot of finger pointing, as I said, even before this earthquake towards the Erdogan um, government and the ruling, um, the ruling party, the AKP party. Um, so in terms of what the earthquake, you know, the impact it's going to have, ultimately, we're going to see it really aggravate these underlying existing socioeconomic issues. Um, we've seen estimates of uh, that this earthquake is going to cost Turkey, um, a GDP point of, of one. So that's kind of really, really critical um, 1% at the moment when your GDP is already suffering uh, massively. Um, and these figures and these statistics, people are ultimately pointing back to Erdogan and saying this is a result of your kind of short-sighted monetary policies um, that were kind of controversial, etc. So as I said previously, this political rhetoric is only going to kind of accelerate um, and we are going to say, basically see a much more contested election than we previously were already. Um, it's worth noting that Erdogan uh, doesn't necessarily lose, but like lose well. He's not a very good loser. We've seen that in previous elections where he has kind of turned things around quite quickly. He's implemented any policy that he is able to um, to basically, uh, you know, get those get those polls and get those votes. Um, most recently, we've seen you know very very um, controversial economic policies being put forward. The complete scrapping of the retirement policy, uh, retirement age, sorry, um, and also uh, just kind of hiking minimum wages that don't, you know, sit well with, with the kind of economic um, framework in Turkey. Um, there is talk of him potentially postponing elections. Um, you know, he might use state of emergency powers that are currently in place for three months um, in southern areas to basically say that there is not the appropriate framework both legally and socially, to actually host elections. Um, and this is a real possibility. I think that we have already seen him try and change the election date to the 14th of May. Um, to do this, he's going to have to dissolve Parliament in March. So I think March is going to be a critical kind of flashpoint and date for people to look at. What he does in March um, will kind of constitute what's going to happen in the elections. Um, the opposition have been very, very vocal, saying that elections won't be postponed. He can't postpone them. It's unconstitutional, etc. But ultimately, we know that this doesn't matter for Erdogan. He has uh, sought to kind of the change the constitution before. Him even running right now is anti-constitutional you know he's saying that he it was a different constitution when he was in power in 2017 so he's able to run now etc so basically nothing is off the table so we'll obviously look for triggers and indicators domestically but i'm interested in their foreign policy what does this mean for turkey's um, foreign policy or even Syria's foreign policy yeah absolutely so you know as i previously said on the podcast before we were talking about yeah you know what turkey's electoral landscape looked like um erdogan has always and, and really pushed for a really assertive foreign policy in the last couple of years. I think he's realised that he's needed to kind of diversify economic revenue streams in Turkey to, to support his quite very controversial monetary policies domestically. Um, and what we've seen in the aftermath of the earthquake is actually um, how potentially this 
very assertive foreign policy has benefited him in terms of the amount of aid and, and kind of relief that he is um, receiving. Um, the main thing to look at is the support that Gulf states and the GCC in general um, has provided. Uh, we've seen, you know, looking at local news outlets across the Gulf, it has been just a flurry of how much aid these countries, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, are providing. We've seen the UAE has built the biggest um, hospital uh, in Turkey, um, uh, you know, in kind of earthquake impacted areas. And, and, and so this really potentially reflects upon this rapprochement that uh, Erdogan has been pushing towards the Gulf states. Um, and, uh, you know, equally, Valeria will talk about this a bit more in terms of um, what the impact in kind of northern Syria will look like with, with foreign aid, etc. Um, but what will be interesting to see is whether we, we kind of see a delay um, in NATO bids as well, um, and whether kind of what the EU response as well in European Union response to to kind of wider aid relief will be as well. But but really, you know, we have seen the benefits of Erdogan's uh, aggressive, <laughs> assertive foreign policy where he's he's really reached out and kind of widened Turkey's scope in terms of kind of foreign relations and diplomacy. So Val, Rihanna just talked about um, foreign policy uh, implications. Uh, I'm interested in, in northern Syria and particularly Turkey's military engagement in northern Syria. What effect, if any, will these earthquakes have on that? Well, um, as uh, Rhiannon was mentioning, northern Syria is uh, quite uh, the playground for proxy um, forces as well as Turkish military assets. And what we've been observing over the past months, for a little bit of context, is the recurrent rhetoric of a ground invasion um, in addition to uh, what we're seeing in terms of aerial and drone strikes. There's been a significant uptick um, since mid-November after a bombing in Istanbul uh, in, by which Erdogan has uh, sort of pushed for a growing uh, targeting of Kurdish assets in northern Syria and northern Iraq as well. Um, however, this earthquake comes at a very critical time ahead of elections. Um, in a moment in which Turkey was ag aggressively posturing the uh, push to, for this operation. But at the same time, uh, we've also seen a rapprochement with, with Syria, um, as, well with, as well as greater dialogue with uh, Iran um, with regards to, to northern Iraq. Northern Syria represents a crucial point um, of Erdogan's sort of political narrative over these past months. Um, he has utilized it domestically uh, to push uh, for a securitization of, of public and civic spaces, particularly after the Istanbul bombing uh, incident, uh, which has led to an uptick in the targeting of Kurdish assets in northern Syria as well as northern Iraq. However, we have also observed a reduced um, sort of presence on the ground in Iraq. And I don't think that this is what we will likely see um, in Syria. However, the imminence of a ground invasion, which has been grabbing the headlines for the past months, uh, we see this as a less likelihood scenario, particularly in the next three, three months. However, um, what we're also going to be looking at, considering the players uh, involved in, in northern Syria, um, the PKK, um, as I was mentioning earlier, HTS, the Syrian National Army, as well as a potential expansion of the Islamic State within Syria, um, are all likely uh, elements to, to raise the, the, the threat level um, and the terrorism threat level for, for Turkey, which would grant uh, Erdogan a motive to go ahead. However, as um, the situation involves and uh, search and rescue operations end, uh, and we shift towards a more stabilization and reconstruction efforts, um, I believe that the dynamic between the Turkish government and uh, Assad in, in Syria will be also a defining point if Erdogan believes mm. that um, he has the backing to carry out what is a very controversial uh, operation um, and that can not only hold on uh, sort of uh, alleged domestic support for it and the security narrative. Sure. No, no, thank you for that. And, and you, you did mention there's, there's quite a lot to unpack there. Uh, I just want to maybe touch on two points. You mentioned some Kurdish groups, obviously, in the region, uh, and you did mention Islamic State as well. And I know we've been pushing up reports on those two entities and that situation for quite some time now. And we've got a lot of client interest in that uh, in that area. So very briefly, I mean, we, we've got this Kurdistan Workers' Party ceasefire. Um, how long will it last? 
um, will this affect it? And by extension as well, just very briefly, is Islamic State in a stronger position? Will they try and leverage the situation for recruitment or land grab? What are your thoughts on that? Yes, there's definitely, it's quite a, a dense a dense area with regards to the presence of extremist groups, rebel groups, opposition groups. Uh, it's, it's quite a mixed bag. Um, to start with your, the, the first part of, of the question, the PKK ceasefire is uh, a very delicate balance. Um, I think the PKK does uh, want to protect its reputation and not carry out attacks at such a sensitive time. Um, there was a, an incident right in the aftermath of the, of the two, two quakes and there was uh, some significant backlash. And um, uh, we think that the, the PKK is well aware that this um, is for the group a great recruiting opportunity uh, in southeastern Turkey. Um, however, should the uh, Turkish government and the Turkish military carry out operations in, in Syria, this obviously increases the likelihood for the ceasefire uh, to, to be over. Um, absolutely. The Islamic State is, is, is a growing concern, and it has been in Syria, uh, I'd say, um, for the second half of, of last year, increasingly. They, there has been, have been a number of prison escapes, including one uh, right after the earthquake in Rayo, which is a um, bordering town it's about three miles from the Turkish border, uh, in which about 20 um, ISIS fighters um, escaped. Um, but currently, there's about 10,000 Islamic State fighters in, in prison camps, detention camps, um, that are mostly overseen by Kurdish forces, uh, but also by um, sort of uh, Assad-backed forces. Um, and this is obviously a growing problem because the Islamic State has carried out what is a very, in, very resilient uh, insurgency in Syria. And they have regained uh, areas in central Syria, have carried out more sophisticated attacks, um, and a lot of the, the mitigation of the border threat of the Islamic State uh, had been sort of thanks to the joint operation of Russian um, forces uh, and uh, of Turkish government, uh, sorry, of Syrian government um, forces in the area. And with more dispersed and stretched capabilities, as well as an increased movement of population, um, we are expecting to see the Islamic State to take advantage of the possibility of a security vacuum to uh, be more embedded within the civilian population. Something really notable is that um, the, in the areas affected by the earthquake, um, the Islamic State has a lot of uh, senior to mid-level commanders and that the group could uh, very well utilize this opportunity to cross the border within Turkey with uh, a lot of ease. And, and on border crossings, um, obviously there's a criminal element to this as well. The area is well known for serious organized crime. So beyond the increased you know, humanitarian access, which is ostensibly a really positive thing, what are the risks associated with opening of you know, two additional border crossings, for example? Absolutely. So what we've seen, uh, thanks to the opening of the border crossings, is a, a significant increase in aid, which has, uh, is it's much needed and it has also been much delayed uh, in uh, portions of northern Syria. And trucks have ranged from 100 to 140, which is a lot of traffic overall. And considering the sort of smuggling routes uh, in that area, we are likely to see a greater infiltration of, of these groups. And smuggling um, can go from medicines to textile to uh, construction materials, but also weapons. Um, and uh, what we're seeing now is increased concerns uh, for gaps in which, for example, Iran may be able to smuggle weapons um, within Syria and uh, for groups also, uh, for terrorist group, extremist groups and criminal groups to sort of capitalize uh, uh, on, on, these, on these operations. So a really complex security environment for um, our, our clients to look, look out for in the future. And I'm sure we'll be reporting on that um, in the coming weeks and months. But just before we wrap up, uh, there's been a lot of kind of blame shifting here from uh, uh, Erdogan. You, you cited it before, the fact that, you know, he's very reactive. We've seen the arrest of contractors, for example. Um, in terms of the business environment and the operating environment for organizations and, and companies, how are we seeing uh, this incident affect that and, and the aftermath? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So first things first, you know, we've seen that Erdogan's not too bothered about throwing people under the bus. Um, so a lot of these local contractors um, or organizations have actually, you know, been affiliated with him himself or kind of um, private 
private donors, etc. So it is deflection, it is blame shifting, as you said. Um, and, and so we are likely to see more arrests. We are likely to see kind of a harsher crackdown um, on the construction sector in general. Um, I think obviously we've seen a lot of empty promises and people are now asking for kind of tougher responses. And I do think ahead of the campaigning and ahead of elections, that will happen. So I do think that we are likely to see kind of increased compliance risks for businesses um, in the coming months. There's going to be potential kind of overhaul of the construction codes, etc. That was potentially supposed to happen in 20, you know, 19, 2020, back to 2013. But I think there's going to be kind of more stringent legal measures taken now. So if there are those kind of gaps um, in your construction codes, et cetera, or your kind of compliance, then these are really, really going to be kind of highly exposed in the, in the coming months and, and years. Um, Obviously, on one hand, uh, you know, with, with such a disaster, there are real opportunities for kind of reconstruction and reinvestment um, in Turkey. Um, it is a bit more tricky, as you said, because of the socioeconomic deteriorations of kind of that landscape. Um, we also have a real uncertain political environment in the coming months. So with this comes market uncertainty. Even before the elections, uh, before the earthquake, sorry, we were saying that the uncertainty surrounding the election was going to make kind of an operational environment quite difficult in Turkey. If we have an Erdogan success, then we potentially see some business fluidity. We see kind of less policy risk because it's going to be the continuation of what we've seen really, you know, over the last 20 years since he's been in power. Alternatively, if we see the opposition gain ground and there'd be a change in government, um, then this kind of exposes a bit more kind of uncertainty in your business environment. We've already seen that the opposition want to entirely rechange the political model, take it back to a presidential model, etc. So again, this is going to result in kind of regulatory changes and just a more general uncertain political environment that businesses are going to have to operate in. Our third scenario, of course, is that we don't have elections and that there's an uncertain, again, uh, electoral roadmap. So I think the main you know, takeaway from this is that the construction sector is going to face kind of real scrutiny, both government led and from the public. So potential reputational risks, et cetera, brand image risks if you, know, you are um, perceived to be um, you know, responsible for kind of building collapses, et cetera, within the construction sector. So I think that's something to, to look out for and kind of social media scrutiny. Um, and then alternatively, also the uncertainty surrounding the political environment in, in Turkey, which is really going to persist through to May and June. And that's it for the deep dive. Uh, thank you so much to Valeria, thank you so much to Rianne and, and of course to yourselves for joining us. Please remember to like and subscribe however you're viewing or listening to this podcast. And if you'd like to ask us any questions or just reach out, please do send us an email. I believe the address is going to be in the show notes. We'd be delighted to answer any questions you have or indeed discuss how Sibline can help you and your organisation navigate the world of risk. I've been Gareth Westwood, Head of Global Intelligence, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.